Okay, uh, morning everybody. Um, we were uh, part of a group to think about um, function uh, and integrating function with uh, sequence variance. And we went a little bit beyond that because we think that not all function is, is uh, in genetically inherited. It was this group here. Uh, we had a spirited uh, 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 interchange for more than two hours yesterday that was very helpful. So, um, and, and I, I guess we had observations. I don't think there was a lot of disagreement. Uh, there were cer certainly some new ideas and ideas that came up, but one of the themes or key things is that this is a really important part of what genomics should be doing, and obviously in HGRI, the time is actually right for a variety of reasons. One of them is that there are lots of variants, and the other is that there are lots of ways of studying function of this that are being developed that are much, much higher throughput and, and way better than what we've had in the past. And it, we, we actually hope what will happen from this is that even better new ideas will come up to uh, in addition to the ones that are, 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 are available now to really tackle this problem. But clearly there needs to be some way to, um, and NHR can lead the way on this, and it sort of does already, but can in a, maybe a bigger way, to integrate the functional information um, you know, uh, with the DNA sequence variants that we're all talk we've been spending this time talking about. And so the, one of the first things that came in our planning for this and in the discussion is that <laughs> the F word, um, what, is, what does function mean? And there are lots, we, don't, we didn't get into the debate about, um, about the, the arguments of different uh, approaches of, um, of, uh, uh, and different levels of, uh, of function with regard to evolution uh, or other things. But we did talk about the two that really probably really matter to this group. Uh, and that is uh, when you talk about function, you can have a molecular, a molecular function. A DNA sequence variant in a, in a promoter affects transcription. That's something we know how to measure, uh, things like that. Uh, a DNA sequence variant makes a protein have a, uh, not be made any longer. We can understand, measure, and codify those and study those on a large scale and, and, and systematize it. Um, uh, but the other way of thinking about function then, of course, is whether that DNA sequence variant then leads to the outward phenotype, because of course the outward phenotype at, at the organismal or the person level is a com way, way more complex than measuring a promoter in vitro, for instance. And so, of course, those need to be part of the goal is to try to link those. But we did talk about those differences because um, uh, one thing that is being done to some extent and we think needs to be done in a much more systematic way is that first part of molecular biochemical and even cellular assays for function are, are ones that can be done in high throughput ways where we really can think about uh, measuring not just thousands but hundreds of thousands or, or very, very many of, of those variants. You heard about some of that already. One point was also made that, that the DNA sequence variant and uh, affecting, let's say, a, a transcriptional cis-acting element, uh, uh, those are, are very linked together. They're closer, whereas the organismal, the variant in organismal um, uh, in, in changing of an outward phenotype um, is a little bit further removed, or maybe even a lot further removed. And one of our um, uh, uh, members of the, of the group um, uh, came up with the, the point that we really need to find the, in, in, so what is it we need to do? We want to find the sweet spot. We want to be able to do this, or we ought to be able to do this on a large scale, but not have such ambition that it's ridiculous and it can't be, be reached. Um, so the idea of figuring out lots of readout out, uh, for modest investment, and you're already seeing some of those. You heard about some of those yesterday. And then um, uh, uh, there was discussion about the different models that we have. Um, you know, if we work with a particular cell line or set of cell lines, are those really good models for um, a disease or a phenotype? Uh, is mouse a, a good a good one or not? Even talked to people even talked about other uh, model uh, mammals um, or vertebrates. Um, so. Um, the, and this was an interesting uh, multiple discussions about this is that there are a couple of ways to think about coming at this top down and bottom up and and um, we've Mark cleverly color coded these so that you can see the, the yin yang here but one of them is that you just go and, and somebody referred to this yesterday as agnostically you go and you just figure out all the variants 
and you might even make those. It's not just find them, you might even make them. And then you figure out, um, uh, 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 sorry, uh, you, then you figure out how they then intersect with uh, those found in disease studies. So Jay's talk last night, Jay Shinduri's talk la uh, last night was an example of that. But the other one is starting with the list of disease variants and then figure them out functionally. And it's not, you don't want to do one or the other, we think. You, you probably want to do both and, and have them kind of meet in the middle. So I'm just going to continue on from Rick. Uh, so another aspect of uh, this uh, resource we're talking about, that's sort of another dichotomy, is on one hand, we would envision a kind of um, a functional resource as something to do with a sort of large number of genes, variant cell types, a sort of breath-oriented thing that uh, puts together the results of many standardized high-throughput experiments. The contrast of this, of course, is studying function uh, in detail, you know, a kind of depth-oriented approach. Um, looking at particular uh, diseases, particular genes, and obviously this requires uh, domain experts, very detailed assays. Many of, many of these things can't realistically be scaled, but we felt that they were very important. And we also felt that they're not necessarily the province of NHGRI, but they perhaps could be in kind of partnership with um, other groups. And the consensus of the breakout group is, of course, we need both of these things together. We need both the breadth and the depth. And we felt that the, the glue to put both of these things together would be a really uh, good informatics infrastructure that really uh, ties together uh, these um, overall uh, kind of uh, breadth type of landscape with the detailed analyses on uh, particular things and how to do this in a simple fashion and so forth we, we see as quite a challenge. Uh, so I, we've now sort of talked about the main aspects of this uh, resource that we envision, but there are sort of other considerations that uh, came up in the um, breakout group. One was we're really talking about scaling to a whole genome level, but there's of course another type of scaling that's going beyond the whole genome, going to a whole population, doing functional genomics on an entire po um, population, and we were very enthusiastic about this to some degree motivated by the great success recently of all the EQTL and related projects. And we urge people to really start thinking about a almost a personal functional genomics that goes with, uh, you know, personal genomics. The, the vision is in the future, in addition to having your personal genome sequenced, you will be doing personal functional genomics on yourself, doing gene expressions, methylomes, whatnot on yourself over time and analyzing them, and we need to be prepared for that type of data. And then another thing that uh, came up in the breakout was that um, functional genomics is really valuable beyond just <laughs> characterizing variants. Um, there's this idea that we can use high throughput sequencing to do more things, for instance, to characterize uh, cell types regardless of genetic variants, for instance, to develop uh, biomarkers. And a great example of this was uh, the challenge talk uh, last night from Aviv uh, Regev, where she talked about single cell uh, transcriptomics and this human cell atlas uh, project. So now I'll just try to summarize uh, everything that we talked about in one um, slide. So the key idea is we think the, the uh, our breakout was about uh, integrating function and sequence, and we think this is a great time to do this on a large scale, basically because we have lots of variants now. We also have lots of new technologies for, um, you know, giving us function on a large scale. We felt that the right way to do this would be in terms of a large-scale uh, research project, providing a functional framework for the entire uh, genome. And, you know, there's some aspects of this resource that we looked at. What type of function should we look at? Molecular, cellular, organismal. We think the first two really scale well and can be systematized well. There was this dichotomy between bottom-up and top-down. Should we look at all possible variants or all possible regions of the genome that intersect them with disease variants, or should we start with the disease variants? and then figure out doing broad functional assays on them. And then there was also this um, other dichotomy between the sort of breadth-wise standardized resource and then really the domain experts drilling into the genes. Again, we need both. We need to integrate them with an informatics um, architecture. And then finally, there was these other aspects that really came up, the scaling the uh, functional genomics to a population, the personal functional genomics, and then this idea that the um, there's more to functional genomics than just looking at variants and, um, and so forth. And that was really a summary of our, our session. Uh, let me add one thing that I, I meant to emphasize is that the multiple members of the group 
felt where you see something where you say, well, that's not scalable, that maybe one thing an HDRI should do is challenge people to make them scalable. So think the impossible now. Because I, who was it? it? was Joe yesterday said we would have never dreamed we'd be where we are with sequencing, or at least most of us wouldn't have, I think, um, five years ago. And so uh, it's hard to scale the organism. Well, maybe somebody will come up with a way to do it. And maybe one of the things that an HDRI should do is put those challenges out. So, so uh, it seems like there, you're talking about uh, two things. One, uh, locally in the genome, uh, what, what uh, changes in gene expression uh, are mediated by a particular variant, and trying to assay that. Um, I'm not sure exactly where that fits, whether some of that fits under ENCODE, whether some of that is its, is its own project. Um, and then once you know, once you think you know what product is being affected and how, then trying to figure out how that, how that product is deployed and, and, and altered. Uh, the former is more obviously scalable than the latter, although you can imagine at least creating resources so that when you pick, when you want to go in and do deep studies, uh, you, you, can, you can have that. But did you talk, did you talk much about uh, how how this interacts with ENCODE? Uh, uh, yes, uh, and certainly thought about that, and there were several ENCODE people in the room as well, but it's, but, and it's beyond ENCODE as well, the Epigenome Project and several others as well. And whether you call it ENCODE or not, it's at least a big part of that mission is to find, and that's, that was a combination, is a combination of non-coding as well as the coding elements. The, in some sense, the, code, the, the coding elements are not completely finished, but uh, much, much further along than the mil probably million different cis-acting uh, regulatory elements. That, and that clearly is part of this, a major part of it. But let me, Bill, I'm not sure if you were getting at this, but somebody yesterday, and I can't remember, said, let's don't forget about the proteins. Who, who do I, I, I um, uh, Ewan and others maybe have, and certainly that matters too. So one of the questions is whether you could, so, so we know how to, to take cis-acting transcriptional regulatory elements and test them on a high, high scale and probably could do a lot better than that. You heard one yesterday, there are several others. Um, when you start to think about proteins and you have variants, uh, then they, it seems like each protein becomes its own project, except there are classes of proteins, you know, ion channels. You, and so you could consider having ways of testing those, you know, at least classes of, of those, and maybe way beyond what I can imagine now, ways of doing that on a, on a maybe even an ultra high throughput uh, way. And that's probably valuable too to consider both. I, can I just add that I agree with that, and we have lots of examples in model organisms even that don't have a backbone, that, uh, that, that there are a lot of cases where our, if you measure RNA levels, you have a very incomplete view of, of gene product, functional gene product deployment, either because of, gene, of RNA editing or because of variations in in the translatability of different products or, or localization of products. Localization of RNAs and, and proteins is extremely important as well. And so no, having all of that information as a catalog would be extremely valuable. So th this is, a, on the one hand, very exciting uh, direction to consider. And I guess, I'm, and I'm sure that you thought about this in your session, but it, it, it can be helpful to learn from history when one thinks about scaling up functional, you know, systematic functional efforts because it, it, those can be very vulnerable to scaling up false positives and false negatives uh, and, you know, type 1 and type 2 errors because one doesn't know often exactly when one is making those errors when you get into uh, systematic experimentation. So uh, one could imagine a couple different ways of, of approaching this. One would be taking uh, very well-defined assays that, that are uh, where one understands signal to noise extremely well and maybe uh, in those running uh, running systematic studies where it, you're only going to look for extremely strong signal so you know things that are sort of in the twofold range here and there I mean whatever whatever one defines but they would be extremely strong signal and that's how one would and maybe that would be 
uh, looking at variants for which we really don't know the function. So the, so very strong signal would give us a clue as to what the function might be. But then the other extreme would be to uh, pick contexts where one can partner with disease experts, people who have been studying these areas for years and can, and, and can help advise context-specific, extremely exquisite assays that are really only practiced by a few, uh, but where the parameters are very well understood, and then in those put maybe kind of a more candidate set of alleles where we're trying to understand function, uh, as opposed to sort of saying we're going to take, you know, four assays and we're going to run everything across, because otherwise you, these kinds of things can easily lead to uh, lots of uh, spurious data, artifacts, et cetera, if we're not careful. So you so. just articulated better than we did <laughs> exactly that point about the, the two different, um, you know, top, top down versus uh, bottom up uh, approaches. And, um, and, and uh, so clearly you would want to do that when you want to del delve into the details and that, and that, while we said that's not scalable, maybe there are, there are lots of experts, you know, part of it is, just, is, is the coordination part of that. And so I think there's no question that that should be done. But your, your, your point about the false, uh, about, you know, you might be testing things that aren't important. If the assays are ultra high throughput and very, very inexpensive, I mean, you could argue, test every single variant we've ever seen, you know, even, uh, and maybe we could do that, but we probably don't need to because we have other hints uh, and maybe even other evidence that this region, even though it's out in the middle of nowhere, is probably involved in transcription because there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there, you know, histone marks, et cetera. So a guided approach for that slightly agnostic but still guided based on other kinds of function might be one of the ways at least to study transcriptional elements. I just, I just want to add to Rick's comment that, you know, part of really integrating the kind of domain experts with this breadth uh, sort of oriented resource could be um, developing kind of uh, error estimates for the things. You know, if you put this data together in an intelligent way, you can use one to calibrate the other and vice versa, which I think would be very powerful. Yeah, uh, uh, th that was a, a great comment, and, and, and you, we're hearing some very exciting ideas and so for, for large-scale projects could have a, a really big impact. I wanted to generalize what he just said to emphasize that we have to have objective metrics of progress. We were stating these big lofty goals and we need to have some idea of whether or not we're really making progress. A really tough one for, for, for this one is to uh, take your predictions to a panel of domain experts and as one member of our group said yesterday, well, would this really give an accurate diagnosis and, and, and uh, 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 an action plan to a patient. Right? So those are really tough, to, uh, um, but I think we should em embrace those. But also, the I, I think you might have alluded to this, but things like the CASP co competitions, uh, 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 you, you know, to uh, uh, have a have a, a, a set of, uh, say, well, in this case, it was not known protein structures, and can you predict them? But we could, mm -hmm. we could do the, the, a similar thing. We're doing that for our gasp and other things. But having metrics of progress, we've got to have them. I was going to say, I certainly agree that having metrics of progress is important. But I think it's also important to think about um, you know, maybe this resource is not necessarily going to have predictive value for the patient, but maybe it's going to be something that people are going to use as a starting point for uh, follow-up experiments. I mean, I think, you know, uh, an encompassing resource that's really meant to enable um, genomics uh, throughout the NIH, just beyond NHGRI, is really going to be the starting point for people who are going to drill into specific things and really understand them. So I think we, we need to think about exactly what metrics would be good in that context. Me or? <laughs> so, so if one goal of NHGRI is to connect sequence with health and disease, it, it's striking to me that an item missing from both these breakout groups is, is the absence of an effort to connect drugs that can impact genome function with efforts to understand variation. You know, there's it's just one uh, new chemical probe, JQ1, directed against BRD4 can have a, has been shown to have a positive impact in preclinical studies on cancer, cardiac hypertrophy, inflammatory and in, inflammation, and it's a uh, it's a reversible male contraceptive in mice. So, you know, and there's a broad, broad effort to develop uh, 
preclinical small molecules that impact the genome. Why in the world wouldn't we want to be engaged in that? So we should have written that out because we did discuss that. And, and so e uh, iPS cells or whatever cells, and pharma is actually, uh, and other groups do very high throughput screening of, of cellular types of assays. So there's no reason why we can't mesh that and in fact people some people do but the idea that you have the have the variants you know in a cell from the person it can be or however you want to do it and screen use that to test for thousands of things compounds not just drugs other environmental things as well so that's clearly should that's what we meant by cellular assays we should have expanded and that I, but I think that's a really important one that I, see, I see and mm -hmm. and let me just add one thing and connected to that I, th I think we have a very unsophisticated view of all the proteins that interact with our genome. You know, it, we, we just touch the surface of that. So if you, if you want to connect um, sequence variation with, uh, with function, we just need to understand the other 99% of the proteins that are interact interacting with that genome. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know this is... You mentioned this, but I think it, and it was mentioned yesterday, but I think this is an area where model, where model organisms is really quite important to have a model organism line because this is, there's going to be a scenario where you want to know, the, you want to be able to close the loop between here is a, a set of assays we did to study the variation in this protein, and then this is how it impact, or, or these cis regulatory elements, this is how it perhaps impacted this cell model. And then in a model organism, you can go all the way and say for some subset of those, this is how it I impacted the organism. And it's that latter thing which you, you can only do observational studies in human. And, and by having a model organism component to this, one can close out that whole system. Um, and I do think that, I mean, the obvious one is mouse, but I think, I think uh, fish may well be quite useful in this space as well, just because of the, the cheap and cheapness and... Uh, scalability of it. Well, I, I mean, obviously, we very much agree with your point, and I, I'd just like to emphasize that one of the things that did come up in the breakout that unfortunately we didn't emphasize on the slides is really the importance of conservation, of really, you know, if things are conserved both in terms of the sequence but also in terms of how they behave across humans and model organisms really have a strong handle on, you know, what's important in the genome, and I think that's a, a really important way of um, understanding variants and, and sort of prioritizing them. You and just to argue a little bit, yes, observational in humans, except when you start to take cells out and then and manipulate them the way we. So you can do experiments, but they're not. No, no, no. Cell cellular experiments are totally in zone, and maybe organoids. And and I think that I think all of that should be, should, right. one should do those things. And I think it's an incredibly positive thing, but there's a there's obviously a level that you can't do, and uh, and and that's that you've got to have a model. For, yeah, I Yeah, well, one thing we didn't talk about much was how to implement these sort of things. Is this um, a series of RO? I don't know if that's beyond the purview of this workshop, but no, that's is, it, is it a... Carlos. Carl, Carl. Yeah, we're going oh. to start to okay. get to the end of I, But maybe I could see this. This is a very heterogeneous area. I, I think the concept could still be described now. Um, Bob and I were just sidebarring on a little bit. Um, and it, it will take some creativity as the best way to do it, and you could envision this implemented in smaller fashion, but you could also see it implemented in, you know, center sort of activities, especially the scalable parts, too. And I think it will take some creativity as to the best way to implement different aspects of what's presented here. I just want to ask if there's one more question, because we do have to move on. 